In, uh, I started teaching in 1973. Now, in 1973, things were different. For example, I was really excited well, if, you, if you got two colors of chalk for the chalkboard, right? Everybody got white, and if you were really lucky, you got yellow. Okay, so you had two colors of chalk, and it was a chalkboard. You erased it, dust got everywhere, and that was how I started. Then the overhead projector came. Now, the overhead projector was like magic because you could write stuff and then take it off and put it back on. And you could use colored pens. And if you were really, really had money, you could get permanent colored pens that didn't erase ever, so you could use it the next year. See? You guys don't look very excited. <laughs> that was high-end stuff in 1970s, okay? Uh, what's it say next? You have to help. Come on. Oh, words that sound like the now. Some of you remember this. Um, usually at the start of the school year, we talk about scientific method. And one of the scientific methods is an experiment done by Francesco Reddy with dead fish and flies. And when the flies, one of the things that if the fly lang lands on the fish, it lays eggs. And what hatches are maggots. Okay. Now, maggots oh, is one of those, <laughs> it's one of those words that sounds like it looks. I mean, seriously. What else would you call those? What are those? Maggots. Oh. Okay. And it's like blubber. That's another one. I mean, blubber. That's the word. What else is it? It's blubber. Okay. My favorite, though, is pus. I mean, you squeeze what came out? Pus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it can't be anything else, see? So words that sound like they look. And then, you know how sometimes when, you're, when you go home and your parents say, what'd you learn in school today? You know, isn't that irritating? Okay, so here's, here's, here's a way to buy some time. When you're next, what'd you learn in school today? <clears throat> Clear your throat and pronounce. Endoplasmic reticulum. <laughs> okay. Now, they will go, oh, okay. <laughs> You know, and then you're, that's good for three or four days. <laughs> they don't have to know that it really doesn't mean very much, but it sounds impressive. That's, that's all that is, right? What's next? Oh, brothers and sisters, I know you're all here. And you all know the importance of faith. And you got to believe. And you got to believe the rule. Because if you break the rule, there are problems in your life. And so, brothers and sisters, I want you to come along with me now. And you know the rule. Say it like you mean it. I'll say it first and you follow along. One chromosome. From each homologous pair. Goes to each sex cell. Now say it like you mean it. That was average. I can feel the seeds of lack of faith and doubt creeping in. Now, we can't have that because you got to believe. So, brothers and sisters, this time from the heart, dispel the curse of disbelief. Say it like you mean it. I don't understand it. It doesn't matter. It's not the understanding. It's the belief. you got to believe. Let's hear it now. One chromosome. One chromosome. Keep going. Each there, each Hallelujah! It's a room full of believers. Ah, yes. Now, you all know that um, boys and girls are different, but they aren't always different. Boys and girls all start, whether you have ovaries or testes, they all start about here. And then they migrate south during development. Okay. If you're a girl, your ovaries stop about here. If you're a guy, they continue on <laughs> outside the body. This general area. So, now this means you can look at this one of two ways, right? Either girls are guys that didn't make it, or guys are girls that went too far. I mean, probably depends on what you are as to which of those you believe. What's next?
Come on, you got to keep this. Come on, you need to. Here we go. Now, yeah, you maybe ought to give it to him. All right, now, um, ladies, should you get pregnant at some time in your life, it is extremely important that you support your breast tissue. All right, because if you don't, you get what I call the National Geographic look. <laughs> no. The National Geographic look, quite simply, is where you take your breast measurement and your waist measurement at the same place. <laughs> so just you know, always remember, when you're pregnant, you want to use proper breast support. How do you mean Now, I know that uh, many of you are uh, social beings, and uh, you get invited to lots of parties. But I'm sure that there are some of you that uh, getting invited to a party is like a big deal. <laughs> Very good. So let's pretend for a moment. Let's pretend you actually got invited to a party. And uh, you showed up, and you're standing around because it's like new territory. And you realize that there's food. And so you go over, and you get one of the little plates, and you put the little food on it. And then you get some of the punch. And now you realize that you're standing with a plate full of food and a cup of punch and you don't know how to eat, you know. So you think about just kind of grazing off your plate and figure, you look around, just and then somebody comes up and they start talking to you, you know. And then, they sneeze. Now when they sneeze, virus particles come from their nose at you at about 100 miles an hour. Now let's pretend just for a moment that 100 viruses, only 100, viruses hit your nose. Now, the, when they hit your nose, because they're protein on the outside, your cells automatically think food. And so they take, start taking them inside. Fortunately for you, you have white blood cells that roam around your body looking for things that don't belong. And let's say that your white blood cells are really, really good at what they do. And so let's say that your white blood cells kill and eat 90% of those foreign viruses. Now, white blood cells are engulfers, right? So when they see a virus, it's <laughs> and they eat it. Right? So you've got white blood cells, they've eaten 90 out of the 100 virus particles. But those 10 virus particles that <laughs> they missed, they've gotten into 10 of your nose cells. And in about 45 minutes, each of those nose cells explodes, and about a thousand virus particles are released into your body. Now the white blood cells, they've been waiting. And they call their buddies. But again, we're only talking 90%. They're really good. But now, those of you math majors, or those of you that aren't in calculus can actually do math. Okay. What is how many virus particles are going to infest now? You've had 10 times 1,000. 10,000. And 90% of those got eaten. So there's 1,000 virus particles. Thank you very much. There's 1,000 viral par virus particles that are going to infest 1,000 nose cells. Okay. And in 45 minutes, 1,000 times 1,000 viruses are released into your circulatory system. Now. What happens when your cells explode is they release all the stuff on the inside, all the cytoplasm. And what it ends up is, that's like, you call it slimy mucus, you know, when your nose runs. And so if this happens, why on earth aren't you just a puddle of cytoplasmic ooze? I mean, seriously, if 10% of all the viruses every time are just continuing on, you should be dead. They used to be able to hold you in a cup. Right? Fortunately for you, there are other kinds of cells in your body. And these cells are little memory cells, and they just run around looking for problems. Their job is to find things they don't recognize. And so they find something, and they have like this laser measuring device. And they open up their little PDAs and type in the stuff, and they send it off to the thymus gland. Now in the thymus gland, there's some processing that's done, and then there's a search to look to see if this has ever been seen before by your body. Now, this is the first time these virus particles have ever been there. 
And so they assign it a number. It is assigned J27W. So J27W is now the name of this virus as far as they're concerned. And it sends out the same cells in your thymus gland, send out instructions to other cells to make antibodies. Now they're specific for J27Ws. And so the antibodies are made and they're released. So you've got the white blood cells and you've got the antibodies. And when the antibodies get there, they grab a hold of the virus particles. They do one of two things. They just hold, help me! They're calling for help, or they clump the viruses together. And then the white blood cells, okay. because all that's happening, help me! And that stuff, you don't die. That's good news. Okay? Remember, when you get sick, there's only two options. Get well or die. <laughs> so you get well, but not right away, right? You go home from the party, you're feeling pretty good. Wake up at the morning, did you can't breathe? Because all the virus and particles have done their thing. <laughs> okay. And so, if you rest, drink fluids, take care of yourself, your cold will last about seven days. If you don't do anything, it lasts about a week. Now, two weeks later, two weeks later, you head out to another party because you've just become a party animal. <laughs> this time, you realize you can't hold the drink and the food at the same time, so you bypass the drink and just go for the food. Smart. Okay. And you're standing there, and the same person comes up. He's about his part over. Hey, this time, virus particles. <laughs> just a hundred. They hit, white blood cells, oh! ten of them get in, but this time, that little searcher that's running around with the electronic measuring device, it goes, and it gets right on its own little PDA there, J27W, sends out immediate in instructions. And so, what happens? Antibodies come, help me, oh! and so you've got, Oh, help me. Oh, and you don't get sick. That's called immunity. And that's how it works. Ah, okay. uh, yes, I have two boys. Um, my oldest boy is adopted. And my youngest, my youngest son is organic. Um, he, was, uh, he was born. Um, it's a long story, so I'm not going to tell the whole thing. But um, Doug was my youngest. And he was born large. Um, Doug was uh, 10 pounds, 10 ounces, and uh, pretty much, my wife's about 5'2", and so it was, <laughs> yes, it was an ordeal. Um, now, when my, when my wife told, realized she was pregnant, she told me that um, I was going to uh, be with her in the delivery room, and I said, uh, you don't want me in the delivery room? She said, yes, I do. <laughs> no, you don't. Because when I was in college, I took a class on human reproduction, and one of the things we did in there was saw a movie called How to Have a Baby in a Bomb Shelter. Okay, I'm serious. That was the name of the movie. So I went to school. I went to college in the late 60s, and so I mean, that was a big deal. And uh, I spent like 90% of the movie with my head between my knees trying not to pass out or throw up. And I said, what you really don't want, you don't want, you know, the doctor looking at you, and then there's this crash, and they turn around and see me on the floor. You really want to pay attention to you. And she said, you're going to be in there. And I said, okay. So we get ready to go, and, I was, and we get into the labor room. And the um, labor room's interesting because there's, uh, there's just like a bed and a screaming person. <laughs> and, and so um, my wife, like I said, very sweet person. Um, so I'm, I'm there in support. And I'm holding her hand, and every time there's a contraction, she takes my hand and pushes all my fingers into one big finger. <laughs> I'm convinced that if this goes on very long, I'm just going to look like that. You know? <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm a great swimmer, but I'm not going to be able to, no opposable thumbs left. It's just, <laughs> and uh, finally she gets the epidural, and that's kind of fun, except that epidural puts you to sleep from your navel south. 
I mean, your legs go numb. Everything goes numb. So she's laying on her side because Doug wasn't breathing well if she was on her back. And as the contraction comes, she can't feel it, which is very good. My hand is salvaged. But her leg starts sliding off. And she's laying on the bed, and if, she, if the leg keeps going, she's just going to go right on the floor. So I have to sit now in front of her leg. So now it's not my, my fingers are not being crushed. I'm getting kidney damage. And her knee just goes, and smacks into my back. So after well, too many hours, um, the doctor comes in and says, well, it doesn't look like to, that's coming out. We're going to have to go in and get it. Now everything changes at that point. Because now it's not having a baby, it's having an operation. I have had operations. I understand operations. Okay, so that's kind of fun, right? I'm looking forward to this. And we go in there, and they do all their prep work stuff. And this is serious. It takes about 45 seconds from the time they make the first incision until they're holding my son. Now, they thought my son was going to be eight and a half pounds. As they pull out this 10 pound, 10 ounce, this guy's like, whoa. Now, fortunately, my wife at this point is reacting kind of goofily to the anesthesia. And so she has no remembrance of any of this. She's just shivering like crazy. And that's a good thing because when they take the baby out, they lay Doug on her and she can't even hold him. So I have to hold him first. And then they lay her back. And, and while, but then they start sewing her up, okay? Because they have to, they cut her open, all right? And so I'm watching this because it's pretty interesting. Now, you can't tell my wife about it. She does not know this. I'm serious. This, this, she has never heard this part of the story. <clears throat> so the doctor's sewing. It's this white tissue, and he's sewing it together. And so I say, you know, innocently, oh, is that the superficial fascia? He stops, looks over his little mask, and says, What'd you do? Read up on this to make sure I'm doing it right? And I said, no. It just looks a lot like the superficial fascia on the pigs we dissect. And he says, and he says, uh, well, actually, no, this isn't the superficial fascia. And he says, and so he starts teasing stuff away from up by the, where the cut is on the skin. He says, superficial fascia is way up here. And, and he says, uh, He says, what I'm sewing is the deep fascia, and he just push, starts probing around. Uh-oh, somebody's ringing. Is that me? It is me. Heaven. <laughs> hold, just hold that thought. Amanda, I have to call you back, okay? I'm in the middle of story time. 514. Room 514, the lab. Okay. Bye. Be sure your sins will find you out. Okay, um, now, I think that's the end of that story. Doug is born, right? Okay, my wife's sewn up. Good. Here we go.